right, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar, Beyond Online Safety, Digital Citizenship for Advocacy. Please use the chat area to the right of the video to tell us who you are, where you're from, and your role in education while we get started. If you have any questions during the webinar at all, please feel free to use that chat area that I just mentioned to the right of the live stream. An on-demand version of this webinar will be available at the same YouTube link, which you're accessing the live version, immediately after the webinar is over. You can also visit forward-edge.net forward slash webinars for all of our webinar recordings. Feel free to share what you're learning on Twitter with the hashtag FEK12. Okay, so we will get started. Uh, my name is Katie Seamer, and I'm the Director of Curriculum and Technology Integration at Forward Edge. And presenting the bulk of our webinar today with lots of great ideas and tools is Michael Rouse, who is one of our amazing technology integration specialists. Um, so a little bit about Forward Edge and who we are. We are a K-12 technology company and we do um, all things technology from break fix staff to selling hardware to video surveillance and we have a networking team um, all the way until about four years ago when we started the curriculum and technology integration department. And in our department, everyone comes with former teaching experience, uh, classroom experience, hands-on, we're Google certified, and we work with districts to help them identify needs of their staff, plan professional development, and then deliver that professional development, and even coach teachers to help them better integrate technology into their classroom. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Michael to take it away. Thank you very much, Katie. It is uh, great to be with you again to present another webinar. Uh, I am really enthusiastic about this one. There is some there's some really transformative things that we have identified that we're kind of seeing happen and that are starting to happen with this. And uh, we'll go into uh, the deeper part of that here in just a couple of minutes. But we, as we usually do, we like to stop and take a look at some of the ISTE standards that we are uh, really focusing on with the content of our webinar. And, you know, usually we, uh, we have, you know, a couple or three of these that we focus on for each one of these. I think we even had one this year where we kind of said, okay, we're, we're, uh, we're going to hit just about every standard with the content that we're doing today. This time uh, we are really kind of defining laser like focus because we are going to really focus down for the ISTE standards on educators on that citizen standard. And the citizen, the ISTE standard uh, for educators about being a citizen specifically says that educators will inspire students to positively contribute to and responsibly participate in the digital world. Now, we tend to do a lot of work on the second half of that, responsibly participating in. It seems a stretch sometimes for various reasons to do the first part of that, to be uh, to make positive contributions. And that really goes beyond just, you know, treating others nicely and, uh, you know, giving proper attribution for the work that you that you use. And we're going to take a look at more of that today, but we're really going to focus on the uh, standards for educator side on that citizen standard. Taking a look at the student standards, again, we're going to really kind of focus down on that global collaborator standard that talks about uh, students are going to explore local and global issues and use collaborative technologies to work with others to investigate solutions. I will note at the beginning that notice that we did not necessarily say we're going to identify gigantic problems and solve them. Okay, uh, we are going to explore local and global issues, we're going to use collaborative technologies, and we're going to work together with others to investigate possible solutions to those issues and those problems. We may find and, and implement solutions, but we know what path we're on as well as what we are looking, uh, looking to as an endpoint on this. So with those standards in mind, I want to take just a couple of minutes to make sure we're all on the same page when I talk about when I use this term digital advocacy. 
we're used to uh, using the word digital to define and to uh, identify a lot of the things that we're doing in schools these days. But we use it with some other terminology. We don't always use it with this word advocacy. So let's take a look at this uh, little structure that we've put together. At the very bottom, there's digital literacy. On top of that, we see digital citizenship. And then on top of that, we've placed this term digital advocacy as if we're building up one, upon top, uh, one on top of the other. So uh, with this kind of structure, what we're meaning is when I'm developing digital literacy in my students, that helps them to be able to say, I am using technology effectively. They are adept at using the technology to do things. They know their way around when they are, when they have their hands on the technology, or they know enough of their way around to be able to, uh, to be able to, to use that technology in an effective manner. Once they have that, and students don't necessarily, they do not have those skills and certainly don't all have it at the same level when they come in the door. So it's still important to work on those digital literacy skills with our students. On top of that, then, we, we start working on digital citizenship. They're not just using the technology effectively, they're using the technology appropriately. Here's where we are working uh, with them on using the technology uh, the same way that they would, uh, the same way that we have behavioral expectations for them in their academic environments. We have behavioral expectations of them when they are engaging in using technology as well. So we've got that digital citizenship layer that we put on top of digital literacy. Finally, the capstone, though, and where we're really focusing our efforts with this webinar is that top layer of digital advocacy. Once they're using the technology effectively, they're beginning to do that. Once they've begun to learn how to use the technology appropriately, now it's time to turn them loose on how they can use the technology to make the world a better place. And so that is where we're going to focus our efforts with this webinar today. Now. Uh, with that uh, with that kind of definition in mind and that progression in mind, you might be saying, uh, show me some examples. Let me know what this looks like. Let me know what this what this sounds like um, in practice because that really that may be a, a way that really helps you to understand and and uh, and see models of what's going on. So we've got a couple of examples we'd like to show you. Uh, this first one is a very recent example uh, of doing good in your community. I've seen this on a couple of different news stations now, seen this uh, come through on some social media feeds. Uh, there was a two-year-old boy uh, in Farmington, Minnesota. So if you are anywhere in the Farmington, Minnesota area, uh, this is a great a local story for you guys, but it has been picked up by some national media outlets. Uh, a two-year-old uh, boy who has a degenerative condition that prevents him from having the same kind of mobility. You know, usually at, at two years old, that's about the time that their kids are getting up, they're walking, they're moving, they're, they're really getting mobile. This young man, with, because of a degenerative condition, doesn't have that. And his, uh, his family insurance kind of had him in, in, had them in a bit of a catch-22 situation. They wouldn't pay for a device that he was not already adept at using and this well he can't get he can't learn how to use it until he has the device and so uh, of all places they turned to a local high school robotics team with this problem and that robotics team took some uh, patterns that are uh, made available from the good folks at the University of Delaware in the Go Baby Go program, uh, a wonderful program. We'll make sure that the links to these uh, get put in the uh, in the comments or in the chat box uh, for this uh, webinar at the end. Uh, but the Go Baby Go program makes some patterns available for some mobility devices. The robotics team at this high school took this uh, took their designs and put together something that this young man would be able to use. What you're seeing in the photos there is a, a, a bicycle seat, a bicycle you know, uh, adaptive seat for, a, a, for a, a toddler to ride down, 
attached to a Power Wheels device. And uh, then some adaptations have been made. The green, kind of the lime green pieces that you see on there were custom made by the team and 3D printed on site. So because of this adapted Power Wheels design, this young man is able to move around when he's in the device just by using that joystick. They said it took him minutes to learn how to control that when he first started uh, to learn the controls to be able to move forward, back, left, right, and, and control this new device. So while some robotics teams are uh, designing things that, as my friend Gary Steger likes to say a little bit tongue in cheek, uh, you know, that going beyond that idea of them just building a truck to break somebody else's truck, uh, this uh, robotics team actually took something and made a device to really make a huge positive impact on their community. Here's another example of some students doing something for, uh, for a real public good and in integrating technology in what they did along the way. A friend of mine here in Ohio, an educator, Derek Hinkle, uh, did what a lot of uh, folks do early in their school year. Uh, Derek was teaching fifth graders uh, in Reynoldsburg, Wagner Elementary, or Wagner uh, Middle, Wagner Elementary, sorry. Uh, and Derek did one of those usual, what did you do over the summer kind of projects. And his students asked him, well, what did, what did you do over the summer? And he said one of the things that he did was he and his brother uh, actually were in Tennessee and went to go visit a Civil War monument to an Ohio unit that had fought in the Civil War. And that they were kind of disappointed when they found that the statue was, was really in rather a, a, a state of disrepair. The class then began putting together some plans. Hey, why don't we get that monument fixed? This was a class that had a, in a building that had a very high percentage of students on free and reduced lunch. And they found out it was going to take them $5,000 uh, to get this monument restored. Well, if you know anything about middle school kids, uh, they don't know what they can't do. And so, you know, $5,000, no problem, we can do that. So the class took it upon themselves as a project to begin working to get this monument restored. They held, they uh, created and held fundraisers locally. They wrote letters. They contacted civic organizations. They talked to Civil War veterans and Civil War, uh, you know, veterans families organizations about this project that they wanted to do. Not only did they raise the $5,000 that they needed to have this monument restored, they raised the $7,000 that they needed on top of that for the class to go to Tennessee and be present at the rededication of the completed monument. Um, Mr. Hinkle, uh, gets, he always gets a little teary when he, when he tells the story about this, and rightly so, uh, of the impact on students who really saw something, uh, a, a positive, tangible impact to their work while they were really addressed, while they were addressing the content and while they were addressing the material that he was supposed to be addressing with them and coming up with ways to use technology effectively to collaborate with others to cause and to do some real good for, uh, for the community. So, once we've seen uh, those couple of examples, now maybe hopefully you're you're thinking, okay, that's those are those are nice, but I haven't had any uh, opportunities like that just drop into my lap lately. Uh, haven't come straight to me. How how can I get started with a, a digital advocacy project? So if you need some ways, if you need some places to look, here are some ideas. One that I love is Habitat for Humanity. Habitat.org makes available some fantastic materials for you to get started with building this sort of mindset in your students before you ever leave the classroom. You might understand, you might expect that there is a lot of work that has to be done. There's some groundwork that has to be laid with your group to get this kind of mindset developed. Habitat.org has some fantastic uh, activities and some fantastic resources available that uh, you can have students do individually, that you can have them do as a class. There are also activities that you can have uh, people do as a family, as a family group, 
they have activities that are designed just for service groups. So if you have an after school group or if you have a service group that may be interested in doing that, and then there are complete lesson plans that you can use, that you can drop in uh, to everything else that you're doing to point people down uh, this road of service learning. Uh, Habitat.org has some wonderful materials for this. Another great one that we have, and I always thank Katie for introducing me to this one, uh, is the Sustainable Development Goal, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the World's Largest Lesson not just uh, an idea of, of things that uh, can be fixed in the world or thing, I have problems that can be addressed in the world, but problems that will take people working together to come up with new ideas and new solutions, working together to, uh, to come up with uh, ways to address these problems. These are, the, are based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There are 17 of these. So even if the first one or the first three or the first 10 aren't something that it looks like you want would want to work on, then they there are plenty in there of ways that you can look and say, yeah, there's something that I have a group that would work on. There's something that we can focus on that is something that our group would really be able to to grab hold of and, and kind of sink their teeth into to work on. And so these uh, sustainable development goals Lots of great ideas that are within these. And in that world's largest lesson, some great resources to get you started, to get you connected, and to get you working uh, towards those ISTE standards with real life problems that we face every day. Another great place to look is uh, challenge.gov. If you're not familiar with this one, challenge.gov places uh, some really just kind of places some problems out there that different U.S. government departments are working on or are considering working on. Then they, uh, some of these actually even have uh, timeline competitions to them with cash prizes available for groups that submit, that, uh, that submit use, uh, useful ideas or winning ideas. You can look through the challenges and find something that a group wants to work on. Some of these are very technology based. For some of them, the challenge is gonna be the result, is gonna result in some new technology, some piece of software, uh, something that will, um, that will very deeply uh, be a technology product. However, some of them are simply in terms of analytics or ideas where you will need technology to explore and to formulate your solution, but that the end product is not necessarily something that's a, a full technology product at all. And so the challenge types are vast and varied. And you can look, there are some very, very large ones and there are some uh, fairly small ones that are available at challenge.gov. One of the best parts of this toolkit though, is the project planning phases that it lays out. There are specific materials that are available for every step along this way from preparing, just defining what is it we want to work on and how do we want to work on it? How do we want to try to address this problem? If I have, if I have 20 kids, do I want all 20 kids to try to work on this one problem or do we want to break it down? Uh, do I want five groups of four all trying to work on the same problem? And then as they present their ideas and their solutions, we come up with more ideas that we can refine and that we can develop. Once they go through and developing those, uh, there is a, a set of, of conduct phases where we're actually putting the ideas together and getting those ideas out. There's an award section in this of uh, for evaluating uh, the ideas that are put forward and really coming down on here's what we think this is here's what we think is going to work and work best and a transition time at the end of really saying all right here's what we've landed on here's how we're going to make this information available to the broader public the project planning phases piece of this is a wonderful and useful tool no matter uh, e even if you're not using one of the projects that's listed on challenge.gov this is a fantastic little rubric little checklist for you to use in any sort of project-based learning that you may be doing in the classroom. Another fantastic tool that uh, maybe people wouldn't necessarily think of using for this is Traveling Tales. 
And if you have not looked into Traveling Tales yet, this has a fantastic uh, payoff in it for your students when your class participates in this. Traveling Tales really lets you write around the world in what they call a classroom without walls. You get connected to other classrooms so that you can collaborate to create a tale. Now, we often think of that in terms of producing works of fiction. However, uh, this exact same structure, this same formula can be used to develop things, uh, to develop tools for advocacy for and for civic advocacy as well. Uh, I, we've just heard, you know, recently over the last couple of days about the, the tragedy in Paris with the cathedral at Notre Dame. Uh, this morning, I actually heard on NPR that now the, the best-selling novel in, or the best-selling book in France now since that happened is the classic work, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Why are people buying that book? Is it just the fascination with, with, the, with the title? Well, the original intent behind writing that book was that the cathedral was in a state of disrepair and the author wanted to bring attention to the cathedral. And so he wrote this, this story, this fictionalized account, in order to bring attention to the cathedral at Notre Dame that was in such a state of disrepair, and it began to be repaired. And we've already heard about the, uh, the amazing amounts of money that are being pledged to restore uh, the cathedral at Notre Dame to what it was and maybe even better than before uh, this fire happened. So when we think of this idea of this traveling tales, yeah, sometimes we might think about, about producing fiction, but fiction can even be a great tool in generating social advocacy and generating awareness for projects that we might not have thought of before. One of the uh, great pieces of traveling tales is that it lays out this progression of your story. Uh, starting with the beginning and really focusing on what those characters are. What's the setting? What's the mood? Uh, what are those pieces about this story that we need to convey to the reader? A buildup of the, of the storyline, a real presentation of the core problem or dilemma that's going on, a resolution and an ending. Uh, what kind of an, of an ending that the story then has. And we can do a lot of great things with sketching that out. Uh, with making sure that we uh, have that progression in place and that we understand it and we know we've formalized each one of those pieces of this process. We do that when we're developing a fiction story. We can also do that when we are developing our own story of what we want to produce as far as good in the world. This, uh, this little uh, graphic organizer is available on the Traveling Tales website that you can use. If you want to get a little te more techy with that though, you might turn and look at the tool called Toontastic. Toontastic is a fantastic little tool that lets you do the same sort of story development that we just saw in that graphic organizer. Well, we can do it with this, uh, with, with this app. This app is available for either iOS or Android. So if you're using a, if you're using a Chromebook or a Chrome device, you are gonna have to have it set up uh, to be able to allow Android apps to run and to allow this Android app to run. Um, but for either iOS or Android, Toontastic is out there to let you uh, do some things more digitally, more electronic to create your story progressions, just like you could on that paper graphic organizer that we saw. Well, I don't wanna go too much farther with some of these ideas uh, without making some specific connections to the content because I know that there are many people who are watching this webinar and watching the recording who are saying or are thinking to themselves, yeah, this is great, but how can I include this in my class and still cover my required content? And that connection is definitely important. So we wanted to make sure that we spent some time with that. Take a look at these standards uh, and think about how you're addressing these standards in your classroom. Uh, these are writing standards. So these are from the ELA and um, these are anchor standards. 
So they are present across, uh, across all grade levels in one form or another. Uh, one of them, it says that we have a standard for that students will write arguments to support claims in an analysis of substantive topics or texts using valid reasoning and relevant and sufficient evidence. Students will use technology, including the internet, to produce and publish writing and to interact and collaborate with others. And students will conduct short as well as more sustained research projects based on focused questions, demonstrating understanding of the subject under investigation. With the examples that we already looked at, the robotics team that built the electronic wheelchair, the fifth grade social studies class that helped restore the Civil War monument, those classes engaged in each one of these standards. And they did so beyond a level of having one lesson on it during one day or one week and checking a box that it was done. These were skills that they had to develop and use over and over again as they completed that project, even beyond these, um, these content standards that they were looking at. Okay, so somebody out there I'm sure is thinking these look, these are great, but what about math? Okay, well, let's take a look at some of the math practice standards that are out there. Uh, the Common Core math standards, uh, math practice standards have uh, include statements like this, that students will make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Students will reason abstractly and quantitatively. Students will construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others, and students will use appropriate tools strategically. Just like we saw with those writing standards, we're seeing exactly the same thing with these math standards. These are standards that you cannot get away from when you are working on digital advocacy projects. I love this. Uh, there's a, a blog post from John Spencer. He's a former middle school teacher. He's a, a college professor now. A great blog post on how do you teach to the standards when you're doing project-based learning, which uh, this these digital advocacy projects are, are typically just a, a, a kind of a subset of project-based learning. He really talks about creating large-scale questions where we spark curiosity and then leave some room for student voice. His core message in his blog post is that we have to leverage those content neutral standards. And in doing so, we can look for cross subject compatibility and co-teach even with some, of those, uh, with some of those projects and some of those standards. Above all, don't try to pack this in on top of everything else. We can work this backwards, we can reverse engineer this a little bit if as teachers, as educators, we start looking to identify the standards being addressed within the student's projects instead of starting with the standard and trying to find a single uniform activity that every student will engage in to access that same standard at exactly the same time. So now, uh, after that, you, you may be thinking, okay, they, those are great, but now I, I need some places to look. I need some places to look for ideas to help my students kind of hone in on what they might want to do for their own digital advocacy project. Here are some great places to look. One is the micro lending site, Kiva. Uh, Kiva.org has been a, a real um, favorite of mine for a long time. If you want to have a very, very safe, managed way to let students feel like they are having an impact globally. Set up a Kiva account for yourself or for your classroom, and then have the students start researching. What kind of category would they like to help somebody? Where would they like to help somebody? And then the Kiva organization uh, makes loans available to these individuals. Your money that you put in place helps secure the loans that Kiva is making to those folks. Not only do you make the loan, remember that again, I said this is a loan. After you make the loan, they begin paying the money back. And as the individuals who are receiving the loans begin paying the money back in your Kiva account, you start seeing credits come back to your account. 
So whether you start with $25, $50, $100, whatever you start with in your Kiva account, you say, yes, I want you, Kiva, to support this person's effort. It may be a teacher in Pakistan. It may be a, um, it may be a farmer in Ghana. It may be a, uh, a store owner in Haiti uh, who needs some supplies. But you're making your, you're saying, yes, Kiva, I want you to support that work. And as they repay it, you see the credit come back to your account. And then once the credit comes back to your account, you can turn around and loan again. And so in so doing, you can really engage with a lot of different things that are going on. You learn a lot about geography. You learn a lot about other cultures. You learn a lot about math. You learn a lot about so many different things. You get exposed to so many different pieces as you make your loans available and have them come back to you. Kiva currently has uh, helped 3.2 million borrowers in 80 countries with 1.8 million lenders. They have loaned over a billion dollars, and the repayment rate on the loans that they provide uh, is uh, almost 97%. Uh, so a fantastic way, uh, and also a very, very safe way, for your students to get involved with helping people who truly need help all around the world. Another great way that you can get started uh, with helping folks is through the Channel Kindness website. You can look through their blog and find a lot of great ways that students and that classes are helping their communities and helping folks around the world. And you can get great ideas that then you can take and you can use, even if you tweak or adapt them a little bit, to use them in your community. Uh, so you can find some fantastic ideas. And then not only can you uh, find some ideas there and tweak them a little bit for yourself, but you get to then come back and you can share your own story. If you have an idea for a channel kindness of story in your community, you can go to their website and you can submit that story and you might see it come up and be part of their blog later on. So now, uh, you, you understand what digital advocacy is, you've kind of seen some examples and you've seen some places where you can look to find some uh, things that you can put in place for your students to do those digital advocacy efforts. Now let's talk about some of the tech tools that you might use in order to help students make those uh, make the most of those digital advocacy efforts. One thing you might want to do to get the word out about your efforts and the um, what you want to engage with is podcasting. I want to take a quick look at a few tools that you can use to get started with podcasting very quickly and very easily. One of my favorites is a, an online tool called Soundtrap. Soundtrap has versions that will run either on your uh, laptop or desktop, on a tablet, or even on a smartphone. So you can use this on just about any platform. It has endless potential. Uh, it can be used for uh, creating music and for creating sound recordings. A lot of teachers will use this either for language or literacy training, but it has some great built-in tools that let you create and manage podcasts right inside the Soundtrap utility. Soundtrap has the fantastic feature of allowing you to collaborate on the same recording even when you're not in the same place. And so Soundtrap will let you invite, you, invite other users to collaborate together. Some might do this uh, with music, but you can do this just with voice as well. So you and somebody else somewhere else in your school and somebody else somewhere across the country can be collaborating on the same vo voice recording to create your podcast files. If you take a look at the Soundtrap blog right now, uh, just a little over a week ago, there was a, a new uh, article posted in their blog about uh, the Great American Epic, an after-school podcasting experience where uh, Aaron Upstead um, has uh, put this together with a class in uh, Holt, Michigan, and that the students there in this, uh, there's both a classroom and an after-school component to this, that uh, talking about the American dream.
and what that really means. And they have started creating some fantastic podcast episodes based on this idea. And so getting the discussion just beyond the four walls of their classroom to a place where others can collaborate and work on this same, uh, the same idea with them. Another great tool that you might use uh, besides Soundtrap is Messy.fm. Uh, podcasting does not have to be, you know, it used to be you, you thought you had to have lots of expensive audio equipment. Any of these tools that we're talking about, you can generally do with the stuff you already have available to you. Messy.fm does the exact same kind of idea. There are some fantastic tools that are available on their site to guide you through creating your show. Uh, getting into the recording studio, making sure when you adjust your microphone, some tips uh, about just being on air and what it's like to talk uh, to an audience that you can't see and to talk to an audience that may not be listening to you right away. How to edit and how to publish uh, your finished recordings using messy.fm. Your recording studio is all built right into the browser, so you get to do your own takes with your own microphone. Once you've recorded all the pieces, you get an editor and a publisher that you can drag those pieces around and uh, take your clips, listen to what you're trying to, what you've recorded, put all those pieces together. Uh, you can cut out pieces if you need to and move pieces around to get to a finished recording that takes out all of those uh, little flubs that you uh, don't get to take out when you're doing something live. So when you're doing your podcast, Messy.fm does a great job of giving you some simple editing tools to let you uh, get those things put together and to create your podcast episodes. You can also use Messy.fm to uh, get your message out to a broader audience, whether you have created your podcast episodes using messy.fm or not. You can use your podcasts that you've created elsewhere and bring them in and have the have messy.fm uh, help get that message to a broader audience through their free service as well. Now, for those who may not, uh, it's like, you know what, I don't want to go out and start using another tool like Soundtrap or Messy.fm. Can I do this with the stuff that I've already got without having to go get or go get permission to use another new tool? Yes, you can get started podcasting just with your uh, your G Suite uh, account, that G Suite for Education account that you already have using Google Sites. If you're using Google Sites, I recommend using a free tool called Twisted Wave to do your audio editing. It's a little more complicated to use, but it has a great benefit on the back end. When you start recording with Twisted Wave, here's what your, uh, your recording looks like as you start making your recording and start editing it. You see your waveform of where you're talking. You can go back and review this and stop your recording and, and do all your audio editing that you need to do with some pretty granular tools. But then when you're done, you have the option to automatically save your finished sound file into your Google Drive. Once you save the file to your Google Drive, go find it, make the link of, uh, make, make the sharing options available so that you can, uh, anybody who has the link can listen to the audio. Once you've done that, get your Google Sites, uh, get your uh, Google Sites up, app up, and create your site for your podcast. Call this whatever you like. Uh, the new Google Sites makes this very, very easy. Once you've created this, do not go to insert and hit from drive. That I know it's thinking, okay, you know, I just I put my sound file in drive, so that that's what I that's where I need to go, right? No, uh, that one actually will not work if you try to drop the sound file in straight from drive. So copy that link, that that shared link that you've got uh, from when you've made the the sound file available in drive. Come back to your sites view and go to insert, and then click on embed. And embed is going to ask you to put in either a URL or some embed code. You can then paste the URL for your sound file right into uh, this em embed uh, dialog. 
However, there's one thing you need to change. The very end of your URL says view uh, with some characters after that. Change where it says view to preview and click insert. When you do that, your sound file will be embedded straight into your Google site so that it can be played right there in the browser. Then you can add text around there and you can host your own podcast, as many episodes as you need, right there on your own Google site without having to go out and get some additional service if you have to jump through hoops to get additional services opened where you are. Uh, let's also talk a little bit beyond podcasting of self-publishing. We have talked about Book Creator a ton. I know we've used it in several of these. It's such a flexible tool though, because anything you can write a book about, you can use Book Creator to assist you with in the classroom. Book Creator is a fantastic service. Every teacher can get their own free library uh, that can hold up to 40 books in here. Uh, and you can create these books, obviously, again, on any topic you want without the students having to create their own accounts. You can give them a, a code to join your library and create their own books. You can give them templates where they you complete part of the book for them and they just have to finish it for you to do some more things. You can create portrait, square, or landscape styles. You can create comic layouts, lots of different media types and shapes that are pre-built, lots of backgrounds that you can use to drop in text and to fashion it any way you like to create your own books. Once you've created those books, you can uh, you can cut you can combine multiple books that have been made. You can uh, delete them if you need to make room for others. You can also publish them online or you can download them as an ebook and then make that available any way that you need to as well. Book Creator does a fantastic job of then also letting you read or play back the book in line as well. And if you look at the very top right, there's a wonderful option in here to have it automatically read the book to you as well. And so it will, uh, a, a synthesized voice, human voice, will read all that, uh, the content of the book back to you. Book Creator does a fantastic job of this. If you need more than just the one library with 40 books, uh, a teacher can pay $60 per year and get three libraries uh, with up to 60 books each, and then some uh, licensing options that go up from there. There is also an iPad app version of Book Creator that you can uh, pay $5 for and create as many books as you like uh, on one account. If you're using the volume purchasing account and you need this for you know 100 iPads within your school, uh, Book Creator for iPad is eligible for the volume licensing program where you could get it for every device uh, at uh, half price per device. If you're looking to produce your own print book, you can do that with a fantastic online tool called lulu.com. Lulu.com lets you do ebooks, but you can also create your own for print books without having to uh, get them approved by a, a by a publisher and without having to pay for, you know, a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand in order to get them published. You can create your book here and have it sold as and printed in an on demand fashion. There are some great self publishing guides that are available at lulu.com as well. And you get to you get to uh, follow these six easy steps. You can uh, do this. You can create your own book with your own publishing tools. You might want to do that with, with Google Docs. You can even do that with Google Slides. You might do that with Book Creator uh, and create your book that way. And then come to Lulu, choose your options for how you want to make your book available. And you can then uh, dis you can then also distribute your book through lulu.com or through other online sellers. One other option that we want to mention with getting your message out about your advocacy projects is group vlogging. Now, we've talked about blogging before, letting students uh, type and, and use uh, blogging software. We want to talk about the video blog version of that with group vlogging. YouTube creators 
has a fantastic set of tools out there to help you get started with building your own educational channel on YouTube and how to uh, let students come up with their own advocacy projects that they can then use an educational channel to talk about what they need and what they're doing with their project. So you can go through this uh, tutorial. You can also have your students go through this tutorial from YouTube Creators Academy on how to um, start and manage your YouTube uh, account. There are five fundamentals that they will talk about when you're ta when they're uh, in the YouTube Creators, when you're talking about creating for change, uh, about voice, story, courage, community, and action, and how when you're wanting to do one of these advocacy projects, step one is not necessarily to turn on your Chromebook or to turn on your computer. There are some discussions, there are some decisions, there are some things that have to happen first before you start doing those things. And then that YouTube creators set of lessons on starting your channel, bringing your ideas to life, helping your educational channel get discovered and grow, and then building the organization or business with a YouTube educational brand. With any of these tools that you use, the real heart and the real intent is, is to go beyond thinking that we're preparing students to change the world after they graduate. And taking advantage of the fact that we can leverage their enthusiasm, their ideas, and the opportunities that technology makes available that they can start changing the world now. You must be the change that you wish to see in the world. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Oh my goodness, so many great ideas. I got distracted and ended up eating a whole sleeve of whole sleeve of Girl Scouts. I was so into some of those tools. I think that uh, Google Sites embed the audio file, switch the link to preview is uh, worth worth its admission and weight in gold right there. So um, thank you for so many great ideas to push to digital citizenship beyond just online safety. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, all of those tools that Michael showed you and strategies, we have actually developed an anytime, anywhere uh, micro-credentialing program called Edu Badges that is available to schools and districts where teachers can choose different technology tools aligned to ISTE standards, that all of the information they need to learn the tool is there on the page, Every tool requires teachers to actually implement that into their classroom and then submit the evidence to us before earning credit for that particular badge. Um, we have partnered with Ashland University so teachers can actually uh, earn graduate credit or contact hours their choice for the time that they spend earning these tools. So all of these different strategies and tools that Michael showed you, there are those plus many more available in Edu. The link is there on the screen forward-edge.net forward slash edge you badges and you can also reach out to any one of us if you'd like more information on that. And then the last thing that I want to leave you with today, um, if you liked some of these ideas and you're not really sure um, where your teachers are at, um, particularly if you're responsible for designing and delivering professional development in your district, um, maybe you'd like to take your teachers here to some of these things, but um, maybe they're maybe they're so far off there that we still need to get them at that digital uh, literacy or that digital fluency level that Michael mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, we have designed a survey or an assessment um, for teachers and students aligned to ISTE standards for educators and ISTE standards for students on the student portion um, that really we, we take that information and then we dig through that data and give you a written report with our observations and our near and long-term recommendations. Um, districts have received grants as a part of our results. Um, they've received board approvals, just general um, direction on where to go, as well as general support within the district to move initiatives forward. Um, so again, if you'd like to take your teachers to some of these topics that we talked about today, but really aren't sure if they're ready for those types of topics and strategies just yet, this is a service that we can provide. The website is at the bottom of the 
uh, slide that you see on your screen now. Um, and again, you can reach out to any one of us, um, give Forward Edge a call and they will connect you um, with me. And we can talk through some of these services as well as some of the other services that our district offers. So with that, I will wait um, just a couple of minutes to see if um, anyone who is viewing the live session has any questions at all. Um, I think most people typically watch the recordings, but we'll wait just a minute to see if you have any questions. And I will also share links to a couple of those last slides that are la those last topics that I shared with you um, into the chat. And if no one uh, has any questions, we will go ahead and conclude. This is our last webinar of this school year. Um, we will pick it back up again in the fall though. So we look forward to um, potentially working with you over the summer and from hearing from you, let us know if there's things you'd like to see next year in the webinars as we'll kind of map those out over the summer. Um, but thanks for joining us this school year in our monthly webinars. And we look forward to the upcoming summer and then joining you again in the fall.